So my background as a, well, a saxophonist, but an improviser, I was particularly interested in practices that don't use notation, so hence the title, The Absence of Notation. And I want to just draw very briefly on this notion of haptic orality, which I developed many years ago uh, as a performer listening in a network environment in distributed um, 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 scenarios. Um, so let me take you back very briefly. I was thinking just very basically of notation and what, where it comes from. We think of notation often as, as marking, as signing, as making a sign. Um, and this is already developed in the early 13th century. And it was only about 200 years later that um, this idea of uh, yeah, notation in the sort of musical sense of um, writing or brief writing was used uh, as, a, as a musical um, term. And of course, we talked about the sort of binary ideas of we're thinking often, or it was thought of as the composer as making the signs or writing the signs as the sort of creator. And Ryan said very nicely about you know the performer, please don't interpret, you know, just follow what I tell you. And we all know Stravinsky was very uh, big at saying, you know, I don't want any interpretation, just follow the sign. So the performer is the sort of executor. Um, and what uh, Tor drew on at the beginning this idea of uh, Werktreue, of course, and it developed very much in a sort of musicological language. And um, um, I always find it kind of curious how this, this terminology has stayed with us for so long. So this idea of the, the work is what Western music is all about, of course. And I'm going to blame a few people here. So we've got Jan Brack, contemporary views on musical style and aesthetics. And I think one of the biggest writers or musicologists, probably Karl Dahlhaus, who talks about, and he literally said, the cornerstone of music history is the work and not the event. And finally, uh, Levinson, who also uh, argued that the works are the center and the whole aim, and that's quite strong, of the whole enterprise of musical activity. Um, and to my dismay, uh, some of my kind of f favorite philosophers who were very uh, uh, forming in my upbringing and my sort of academic thinking, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, so even in contemporary philosophy in the sort of 80s, and they looked at some of the works of Boulez, of course, in Mille Plateau, but also always talking about the work rather than the sort of performative execution of the work. Um, so I move forward or about 20 years ago, um, I think there was a bit of a, a revival of thinking about practice and practice of notation. And I'm particularly drawn to Jean-Louis Schaeffer, who's not Schaeffer, not Schaeffer, but he was looking at uh, the practice of a work called The Enigmatic Body. He was looking at the work of Cy Twombly, the kind of gestural painter, and he was uh, there looking at how the artist, by drawing, is engaged in this very embodied practicing notation rather than the art of composition. So I think he kind of injected a little bit into um, this new discourse of thinking more of performance. And most of us, I'm sure, we are aware of the whole idea of musicking, of Christopher Small, thinking not just about composition and performance, or not just about score or notation, but as the whole totality of what is belongs around the musical performance. Um, and then about three years ago, Nicholas Kirk, he gave quite an interesting British Academy lecture um, in April, and he uh, also positioned here thinking about studying music as a performance rather than music as text. So slowly we're moving beyond um, the work maybe in some kind of uh, sense. Um, and I'm the last one um, about thinking about notation, and that's something I uh, have borrowed from Carla Bley, famous jazz pianist composer, who also talks about, she says, my pieces are more like drawings, and I want the performers um, or the musicians to color um, the book. So she kind of provides a book, and you have to put in the colors. So whenever I think about notation in a more traditional sense as a performer, and uh, I come from a very kind of notated background. I've done anything from notes on five staves, no notes on three staves, um, graphic notations, animated notations. Haven't played any of yours yet, uh, Ryan, but um, I've worked a lot with Justin Yang and, and Pedro Vabello. And all the pictures you see here in the background are um, no, graphic notations by piece that we're going to be playing this afternoon called Cypher, and it's a kind of a network piece for, uh, depending on how many musicians you have. So, but what I am particularly interested in is this idea of uh, practices that don't use notation, and I'm looking in particular at free music improvisation, and I'm not going to go over sort of a histo history, but um, free music or improvisation 
evidently developed out of questioning notation, but not only notation, of course, it was more of a political and a social movement, late 50s and, and the 60s. And Derek Bailey, of course, being quite famous of saying, well, we need to question the rules that govern musical language, and which came out of, in a way, a reaction against jazz um, and uh, frameworks, chords and uh, uh, frameworks given in jazz. Um, and so I move on to this idea of haptic orality, and it is really, um, and I'm borrowing here from Jean-Luc Nancy, who has written this very great book on listening, that in a way when you don't have anything to represent what you're doing, so it is being in a space in a much more haptic engagement with your own instrument, with your own tool, but also being in a very trust kind of social trustworthy space where you're uh, relying on other people and <coughs> playing with others. He talks about this possibility for turning, and I made a uh, tuning inward, so this real uh, embodied engagement that you can that you have when you don't look at anything but when you can just focus on listening he says in listening you're always in the state of being on the lookout not just for self but you also construct your own identity in this kind of very uh, close engagement with yourself so it's about consolidating and constructing entity uh, identity um, and finally, um, um, Alain Savouré, who already in the 90s at the Paris Conservatoire uh, started teaching improvisation to his classical musicians, and I find that uh, a really nice way of thinking. He, he always has thought, thought about improvisation, not about tools, not about what he says, a um, matter of fingers. It's not about technique, but it is about uh, what he calls la virtuosité de l'oreille, about this virtuosity of the ear, um, which I think free improvisation practices give you particularly that chance to really develop your, the virtuosity of the ear. So if I had to conclude here, I think you know, there would be a nice argument to make to say, well, I think the absence of notated science al allows for this deeper reverence for musical, cultural and social engagement <laughs> with others. Um, but I have a couple of minutes, so I want to look at this idea of reviving notation. And I've particularly seen a turn in the last few years, and I'm just giving one example. There are millions and thousands of examples, but Stefano Calonaris, being one of my PhD students at the moment, who looks at uh, probabilistic graphical models, for example, he's developed this piece called Mark of Random um, Fields for Improvisers. It kind of uh, builds or base, is based on the activities of the hub and the League of Automatic Composers in the 70s and 80s, the kind of connected computer networks. And here's the sort of GUI, just a sort of setup. But again, giving improvisers directions, maybe a bit like what Ryan's trying to do, you know, how you're supposed to play. You support, you become textual, you become chaotic or whatever. But you're being told in a way uh, to play in a certain way. Um, so you could argue that, in a way, this return for the desire to instruct by, on behalf of some composers, um, it's somehow counterproductive or it counters the sort of socio-political spirit of some of the original ideas that originated with free, what it meant to be free. So it shifts the musician's focus somehow away or, again, towards the object. And as an improviser, of course, I ask myself, I mean, what does that mean for the practice of free improvisation? Um, the question I guess I have, is this a kind of a notational revival that might expand or solidify the practice? And I think it's quite a, it's quite a, a big question to ask, you know, what happens to this idea of free, of being free when you are being asked to, or when you're being instructed to play in certain ways? Um, but of course, being a, a performer, I don't want to just ask questions. I always want to be at the front of the uh, forefield. And I think this ties into what Jonathan was saying about um, notations being a technology, being a node of uh, kind of a crucial node in a network of technologies. And for me, I think it's really important that as practitioners or that practice is always questioning, expanding, and evolving, not just this, but any new notational system. So that's the only bit of argument I want to make, is for practice to question and expand um, any system. And with that, I leave you. And you will hear some of this scriggle, <laughs> scribble later on, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay. Any questions? 
Impersonation. Impersonation. So, if there is no question, I, I will just say that uh, as a practitioner of um, an instrument, I manage with three kinds of notation. And was one is a uh, music savant for me is uh, descriptive of the gesture, but suggestive. You can um, interpret, uh, it's not prescriptive. And then another is pedagogical one, I will not speak about that. And the other is that I transcribe on stave in order to analyze what is not in the first notation and transcribing I, I, I'm thinking how how to write all the content not prescriptive which is in the first notation. Um, clearly your first line with Pedro Pedro way. Below, uh, I, I think I can transcribe like this w what it means because, in my uh, I must say, I, I play uh, chin sitar, it's an, a Chinese instrument and very free. And so, what they intend to describe is the movement, the life of the note, and not its position and other characteristics. So to describe the position, I, I need all this kind of uh, uh, how do you say tree? Um, yes, drawings. Drawings? Yes, okay. So I was interested <laughs> by this. I, I, I Thank you. I don't think really, that, that wasn't really a question, right? It was more common, but I, if yes. I understood you yes. correct, I think you're, you're yes. we in, must the, in the gestures of drawing, yes. right? And I think what you were... If I you think it's not possible to play this, but, but yes, I can play this. Well, yes, okay. well, we will be playing that this okay. afternoon. Mm. And I think you will hear from what I think. It's a very traditional score. Yes. It sounds okay. very traditional, of course, depending on the musicians <coughs> you play with, because we all bring this baggage, I guess, of notational um, literacy. And okay. Uh, and it depends. It can be a very sort of chamber, contemporary chamber music sound that this piece produces. But yeah, right. Okay, thank you very much. So we, will, we will hear what comes out. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. So, uh,